Hi everyone, it's Saren from Tarot Runes and Tea and today I'm going to discuss a really highly controversial topic that I see argued about in so many forums and it's really interesting that some people will get really inflamed um, in terms of their responses on this and that's whether you need a certification or formal training in whatever your divination practice is, whether it's tarot, runes, tea leaf reading, Lenormand, um, any kind of reading whatsoever. Naturally, simply because it's the form I've been reading the most, my descriptions and things I cover here are more going to sound tarot focused, but you can apply the principles elsewhere. Um, in your practice too so just bear that in mind. So I'm laughing to myself this is such a heated debate and everyone seems to think that their answers are the right answers I see some really really quite horrible and nasty and bullying comments on this actually so what I thought I would do with this video is explain the things that you need to take into account when you're looking into whether or not you need to do a qualification and whether or not you want to do one and if you do pick one hopefully it'll give you some ideas on what to look for in your training. So before we start I wanted to cover different terms because I hear them bandied around and certain countries do pick um, certain terms over others but I thought I would just try and unify what I mean so that you understand my language and where I'm coming from. So there are lots of different terms and the first one I hear quite a lot is qualification. I think this is because I'm in the UK, it's quite a UK based term. Qualification usually refers to some kind of professional qualification that has agreed standards across the board. There may be different providers that can provide education for this, but there is some kind of external examination body that is separate from the school that is teaching. It's usually externally verified and accredited. Work is not just sent externally for marking, it is also moderated. Um, and markers will randomly pick things to check that the mark schemes and the markers are marking things to the correct level. And qualifications usually imply that there is something formal or leg legally recognisable. You also have this term called certification. Certification is a really interesting one because I hear it mentioned in the US in places where I would sometimes expect the word qualification to be used but essentially certification is any course that gives you a certificate at the end of it usually a certificate of um, completion although sometimes it can be just attendance. Certification certainly does have a huge or a much wider scope in terms of its meaning so Technically, it could just be anything where you get a certificate at the end of it. There are, however, in the US, different, um, I would say, professions where they use the word certification. And when I've looked into these, so I, I run a healing modality type practice, and in some of these healing modalities, they talk about certification, and this is usually you're certified by the school that also taught you, so it's an internal exam. It may or it may not be accredited by someone externally, and we'll get onto accreditation. And you really want to look into the nature of the qualification and the different schools that offer this certification, as it were so that you can benchmark yourself how valuable you think it is. Now, in terms of um, tarot or rune certifications that you may look into doing, this could be quite easy to do. You could look at what previous students have said from that. You could have a look at what they feel they've gained from undertaking that certification. You could even book in a reading with them and see what you think. Um, 
Do they have a style that you'd like that works for you? Are they willing to also tell you about what worked for them from their course and what didn't? So certification certainly has a broader meaning. It can literally mean you get a certificate at the end of it or it can mean that there is some kind of recognition behind it. But usually it's an internal, as in the training company are awarding you with the certification, whereas qualification is something external to the training body usually. We also come across this word accredited, and I see it a lot with both the word certification, sometimes with the word qualification, depending on what the qualification is. So... When you are do, running a business and you require professional indemnity insurance and professional liability insurance, and most countries do require this, there are some modalities such as uh, healing modalities such as massage or there are lots of different ones that require you to have an accredited qualification or certification of some description. Accredited means that the certification that you get at the end of it has been accredited by an external, it might be an examining board, it might be a professional association such as the Complementary Medical Association or the Federation of Holistic Therapists. Um, There's lots more such as, I can remember the acronym IICT, I can't remember what it stands for. There are a lot of different bodies that will allow training providers to submit their certifications in order to be externally validated and accredited. Usually these are more trade based, so qualification usually refers to a professional qualification such as... um, medical practitioners, doctors, accountants, lawyers. Accredited is usually things such as accredited massage therapy qualification, accredited nutritional therapy qualification if it's not gone down the degree route. So accredited could mean anything that is not formally recognised but it's been recognized by this professional body and this can have two reasons why you would go down this accreditation route. When something is accredited it can mean that you can join that professional qualification and that professional body so it may be you get cheaper insurance you get a magazine you get some kind of membership by the organization that has accredited it usually for a fee per year. There is also the insurance aspect that you need an accredited qualification, so something that's been checked over by someone else for them to offer you insurance so that you are legally practicing that modality, whatever that modality is. And we'll cover this a little bit more um, in a later slide. So accreditation occurs when someone who's got a certification gets that certification externally validated by someone else. And I'm just going to point out here, this is not cheap to do. Usually they are required to take an adult learning uh, teacher qualification. So in the UK, it's something like um, lifelong learning teacher or, or something along those lines. It's not cheap to do. It can cost anywhere between 500 and a thousand pounds to do that. You have to submit all your syllabus, all your practicums, examples. Sometimes you even have to teach classes for them in order to get this body to uh, award an accreditation. And usually they charge several hundred pounds or several hundred dollars for the initial qualification um, accreditation. And then the school or the training organisation that is offering it has to pay this subscription each year. And it's usually around several hundred pounds so it's not cheap for them to offer this accreditation but it does offer the people that take it the opportunity to gain insurance which is required to practice legally in some areas so accreditation can be important and it can be something you need to pay attention to. So the next form of study that you can come across is the apprenticeship. 
Apprenticeships are now becoming more formalised in the workplace. However, original apprenticeships or the original idea of an apprenticeship is where you go away to learn a craft or a skill or a trade. And you're learning pretty much like on the job learning or intensive learning from someone who is skilled in this. Now they're not a qualified teacher like they would expect to be in the top three brackets there. They're not someone who is experienced necessarily as a teacher again that you might expect in those top three categories. However it is someone who is experienced and can pass on their knowledge in a very practical way that means something to you and that you can pick up and that you can keep practice and get lots of experience. Unfortunately a lot of apprenticeships may not be recognised officially because you don't get this certification or accreditation at the end. However I've done a few in different areas in the past and I can tell you they are highly highly valuable and if you've ever had an office job um, that has any kind of technical learning aspect or even just anything above a quick um, sort of admin job where it's literally just typing stuff up or filling in forms. Yes you can be sent off on training courses to do this that and the other but most of us learn the most from on-the-job training and the apprenticeship is usually the equivalent of the on-the-job training. Even if you're doing it online and you're learning things you are learning very practical things that you can usually put into practice very easily. Whereas sometimes with certifications and qualifications, you have a very dry section where you're learning things in theory and then you have to do case studies later on and try and put it into practice. Apprenticeships do tend to be more well-rounded. However, because there is no hard and fast um, label or criteria for something to be labeled as an apprenticeship, it could look different to this, so this is just a general idea of what the term could mean. The next sort of layer is being endorsed. So sometimes um, you might get a professional organisation that doesn't necessarily accredit qualifications or certifications, however they will have a mini version, so it might be that you've got experience or you've done a certification in a particular subject. Um, let's go back to you know some kind of holistic healthcare modality or um, tarot reading or something. So you've got a good foundational knowledge, you've been doing it for a while, you've got experience. However, you haven't got anything that's externally validated for insurance. You may not want insurance as well, I'm just going to point that out. But you do want people to know that you're legitimate. You do want people to know that you are not just making this up on the fly. You want people to know that you're giving real readings, that you're not a machine that is just producing the textbook definition from a card, which unfortunately a lot of providers just do that. And in some cases I've heard that they don't even have a deck of cards there, it's just a computer randomly cutting and pasting bits from a book. So you want people to know that other, that someone recommends you and you want people to know that the person doing that recommendation is qualified to do so. It's not just another client or friends or family. You want it to be someone external. So in this case, and a great example of this is the Tarot Association of the British Isles, TABI for short. They offer an endorsement. This means that you do 20 readings for them. Um, through their website and luckily because it's through their platform it means that people can't contact you directly necessarily and you get feedback and you have a, a mentor I believe who goes through the readings you've done and the questions and looks as to whether they think that's of a professional standard or a standard that they would expect and then once you've hit this number of readings you can go off and say you've been endorsed by them. So endorsement can be very handy in some cases. And then finally there's the recommendation. So a recommendation can be, for example, looking on TripAdvisor. It could also be, I have experienced a really good service, so I'm recommending someone's service to someone else. 
recommendations can be very, very, very subjective as opposed to a qualification which is the most objective on this scale. So a recommendation could come from a friend or a family member. So sometimes just looking at websites is not going to be helpful because the reviews could be made up. They could be from friends and family who have never actually used this service. It also doesn't take into account if you have an idea of what you expect from a reading. So for example, if you have always had readings that have followed one particular pattern because you've seen the same person or maybe someone who trained with them for years and years and years and you compare it to um, someone who reads in a completely different way but you're not expecting it that could be jarring and the recommendation may not have been relevant for you because it wasn't what you were expecting so recommendations can have strengths and they can have weaknesses now if you are being a bit cautious and you're looking at recommendations take a look at sites where they have to verify that a purchase was made so for example Etsy um, you make a recommendation on a purchase TripAdvisor you can leave scam reviews um, Facebook again you can leave scam reviews from fake accounts so just bear that in mind when you're looking at reviews and with Amazon you can see when someone's got a verified purchase and when someone doesn't so do use your your head and think about things and who's written the reviews is there any um, check as to whether they purchased the product or service before writing the review and also when you're reading reviews, sometimes you can tell when you're reading them that someone just has a bee in their bonnet and they're picking at tiny things. And I tend to ignore the several worst and several best reviews and read the ones in the middle to see what the average experience is. I find that's more indicative unless, of course, you see that everything's one star, um, terrible service, things didn't happen, whatever. But generally that's my rule of thumb, read the middle tier reviews to see whether something is useful. So hopefully you can see there is a sliding scale of what a formal training course might look like. Um, the most objective end is a qualification, the most subjective end is recommended. So let's just take a look at what you do need if you want to read for other people. Now I'm going to say it does depend on whether or not you're charging, whether or not you're in a public place, where in the world you are, and various different rules and regulations that are affected by all these. So just to give you an idea, in some countries, if you're caught with a deck of tarot cards, you may find yourself in significant legal trouble. In other countries, you can do what you like as long as you're not charging. And in other countries, you cannot charge for a service unless you've got a qualification, you've got insurance, um, you put on a big disclaimer saying it's for entertainment purposes only, etc, etc. So first thing you need to do is research the law in your country and your state as to whether you can do fortune telling, tarot card reading, provide spiritual services, and I think those are the key categories it comes under. It may also be that you need a business license as well, depending on where you live. So first of all, you do need to do that research yourself for the country and the state that you are in, and sometimes the township. Now, as I said, there are some places in the world where reading tarot cards is prohibited full stop. There are other places in the world where you can read them, but you require a license. And that could be a business license, it could be a fortune telling license, and they may require evidence of your ability to read tarot cards. In some places, professional insurance is required, such as liability insurance or indemnity insurance. 
Liability insurance is probably useful for most people to have if you're seeing people in person because this covers any accidents that might happen if you go, for example, to someone's house and they trip over or you trip over or say they come to you or to a shop that you're working in and, I don't know, they get an electric shock or they trip or slip or something. That's what liability insurance is for. Indemnity insurance is insurance for essentially what most people would consider to be malpractice. Hopefully this is never used, but if you've given someone a reading they don't like, or maybe you've given someone advice on something that you shouldn't have done, um, or maybe you've given advice and they didn't like it, even though they asked for it, this could cover you for that. But again, you'd have to read the insurance call policy and with insurance more often than not some evidence of your ability to do what you say you can do is required and in some places you may just be required to add a disclaimer saying that your reading is for entertainment purposes only so I can tell you that in the UK um, there is an act that I can't remember if it's the Fraudulent Psychic Act that's referred to, but you can you can Google it and find it. But it is not legal to provide psychic services. It is legal to label them as for entertainment purposes only. Also, from my days studying business law, I know that small businesses, and if you're taking money, you're a business, are required to have indemnity and liability insurance and in order to get that insurance you have to provide some proof of ability. Now when I first saw this in relation to my tarot and rune readings I'll be honest with you I thought this was a bit silly. Who can tell tell you that you have the ability to read tarot cards or not? Who has the authority to certify someone? However I have seen and heard of people at psychic fairs who have been asked to provide evidence of their qualification to provide a reading and evidence of their indemnity and liability insurance by trading standards who have actually come on the site. Not raided the fairs but they've gone around and asked for this evidence to be provided. So I found the cheapest um, externally accredited course that I could and got insurance down that route and that's how I've been practicing. Um, other people may find that they can get an endorsement or go down other routes in order for this to work and that's just where I am in the UK. There may be other ways to get around this requirement in the UK but that's just to give you an idea. I've also heard of people in the States that can't read at all. Other people have to apply for a business license. And this is really interesting how it changes from township to township because some cities require that you notify every business around you, including churches, um, in order to get approved for a business license and any of them can choose to um appeal against you having that license. So you do need to do your own research based on where you are and sometimes it can feel really silly what the requirements are. So I'm just going to say from if you imagine you're a consumer and even actually as a professional reader you must have heard stories of people giving really rubbish readings and charging money. They didn't answer the question, they talked about their spirit guides but they didn't give a, a tarot reading if that's what was paid for. They may have given a load of completely irrelevant information that didn't take into account what the querent was asking at all or the absolute worst scum of the earth in my opinion is where they decide that you're cursed or you've got something and they can remove it for this amount of money, thank you very much. And that is very different to by the way, I offer other services if you're interested, his leaflet. So 
I can understand the need to protect the public from people like that. And by doing that, they bring in insurance, they bring in um, certification, they bring in licensing. I do understand that. As a reader, it can be incredibly frustrating that that happens, but equally, that's part of the... Do you consider yourself to be a professional and what can we do to clean up this industry so the biggest thing to take away from this slide is do your research yes it can be frustrating yes it can feel really silly that you need a qualification but sometimes you just have to suck it up because that's what's legally required in your area even if the authorities in your area don't actually understand how or why something works. Sometimes they bring in these arbitrary rules that you have to go along with and sometimes they are there for very good reason. For example, someone in your area was taken advantage of. So, that's the legal aspect of it. Let's take a look at the way you learn. So, does formal learning suit you? And looking at the word suit there, I'm not sure if I've um, spelt it correctly. I'm dyslexic, so feel free to make a note in the comments if it's the wrong spelling of suit. So I want you to take a minute and think back to when you successfully learnt a new skill before. Maybe you don't have much education outside of your formal education. Maybe you haven't learnt anything new. Maybe you have, maybe you've got a hobby, maybe you've learned a new language, maybe you're into cycling, floristry, arts, crafts, sports, whatever it is, have you had to learn something new before? And think about your journey through that process. Think about what types of learning you did and where you learned the most. So, also think, when have you struggled with learning something? Was it a specific subject at school or a teacher? And what I want you to do in both these scenarios is think about what was successful for you and what wasn't. So it might be that you personally work better through self-study, through just reading books, and maybe you make notes in those books, maybe you do books that have exercises and questions at the end and you find that the best thing to do. Maybe you read several books on the same thing by different authors and make notes on what they've got in common or contrast between different books. Maybe you work better through doing, through practice. I am certainly one of these people. Um, so I remember in the various different sciences we did at school, I was more in sort of mind mapping and talking things through and practicing the equations until they kind of made sense. Other people were far better at um, just reading books about a subject and then they could answer the questions. I had to do lots and lots of practice questions for me to be able to answer the questions. Maybe you learn visually. So do you like to watch videos on YouTube like this one? Do you like to see pictures in front of you? Do you like things to be presented to you in like a movie format or a lecture format with PowerPoint slides? Do you learn better through structured learning? So are you one of these people that just struggles to get through a book even though you really, really want to read it and you love the author and everything they've done? So maybe take a look at people who have produced things in different mediums that you enjoy learning from and think about which medium you learnt from the most. One example I can think of in the divination realm is Benabel Wen and she has videos on YouTube She's appeared on podcasts, she's written books, she's written online downloadable workbooks. If you have a look at her different mediums, which ones have you actually worked your way through? Is it her books? Is it her workbooks? Is it her videos? And which ones did you learn from the most? And I've just noticed that says structured leaning rather than learning. <laughs> 
great that my spell checker doesn't work. So, another th- question you can ask, do you work better through mentoring? Mentoring is where you have a mentor and it may be that they're more of a coach so they ask you questions to elicit an answer from you. They may be more of the type of person that gives you guidance or advice. They may be someone who's more like a teacher and marks your work so it might be that you do a reading for someone and they go through and mark that reading at 10. If they're more of the coach they will ask you what you thought and they'll ask questions to get you to come up with the answer as to whether it was good reading or not. So mentoring can look very different. Also do you work best in a study group? So maybe you are with a group of people where you commit to work through a certain amount of material and then you get together and talk about it or do exercises together. Really think about What worked for you in the past when you learnt something new and what works for you now and what you would look for in a learning platform or a learning opportunity. And some things that you can look for, specifically within the realm of divination, I put tarot books here but it could be any kind of book. So Some people like to just read a book and then apply what they've learned in some way, maybe make notes, maybe write quizzes, maybe summarise everything they've read. Some people are significantly into colouring with highlighters. Any of these are 100% valid. Some people like to learn traditional meanings either from a book, from a website, from what someone's told them, from keyword charts and only give readings using those interpretations. And I'll be honest with you, I do know people that use that and it works. The only thing is they have to memorise all these meanings, but it works for them. And equally, I've come across people for whom the readings they've given are not relevant at all because they're just stuck on those meanings. Maybe you want to mind map the card you're looking at or the rune or the symbol, whatever you're, you're looking at. So this could be that you write the card or the rune in the centre of the page and then you draw or write out all of different possible meanings and interpretations around it in a mind map form. I did this with the runes, to be honest with you. Another technique that you might enjoy doing is take the same card but from different decks. So it might be that you take the... Death card from the Rider Waite Smith, the Rebirth card from the Shadowscapes, and I think it's the Rebirth card from the Druidcraft. Three different versions of the same card, and compare and contrast between them and see what things you see that each card has in common, see what you see differently. It can be really eye opening to do this kind of comparison. Another thing that a lot of people do is watch video tutorials, usually on YouTube, but there are other video platforms. Um, Some are going to be very structured, some are not going to be structured. Some people just like to watch other people doing readings online. Uh, Again, it might be on YouTube, it might be on Facebook Live in a group and learn from watching so it might be that you notice that every time someone brings up the ace of pentacles that they have a similar message and you start getting more familiar the more and more you see these readings happen you might want to use your intuition so it could be that you just look at a card and you go with what your gut instinct is telling you to look at in that card I will say that when you use your intuition, the more practice you have with different card meanings, the faster the intuition comes. Whereas some people will say, well, I'm an intuitive reader and something will pop up and they will go completely blank. So the more you practice, if you've got intuition, the better you will be at it. The next one is describing what you see on the card 
So that could literally be, I've got a card in front of me, I can see a particular colour palette, that colour palette might mean something to me, I can see a symbol on the card, I can see what the characters are doing, it might look like the characters are having an argument or the characters are blocking someone or the character is doing something specific. It might be that I see a symbol, it might be an astrological or an alchemical symbol and that means something to me. So it could just be describing what you see on the card and interpreting that for the reading that you're doing. There's a technique which I would count as a meditation or a visualisation called walking through the card. This is where you get to know a card in a lot of detail and you visualise it in front of you in the meditative state and then you walk into that landscape and interact with everything you see in that card. You can just practice doing readings over and over again. So you could literally just ask people for questions, find a spread, do the reading. You might choose to use a book to help you. You might use your intuition, but I do know beginners that have gone down this route where they've started literally by having someone give them a reading and they question and they just give a reading and eventually they get better. Most people do do a, a mixture of these things. There might be other things that you do that help. But whatever you do, you do need to practice a lot. And have a think about which of these you are finding the most helpful because that could guide you as to whether you want to do a qualification or a certification or a course. It can also guide you as to which course might be more suitable for your learning style. So if there's a video course or a workbook that you buy as a book, you might lean towards the video because you're better at having someone read the content to you or you can listen to it as you pot around and do various different bits of work. It might be you learn better by reading in a book. However it works for you will give you clues as to what style of course would suit you. And then you can ask people who have taken the course, not just what the content is of the course and the format, but what kind of style it was. Did it combine intuitive elements? Did it focus heavily on the colours or the symbols and the numerology or the astrological? astrology associations um, and you can really get a feel for whether that course is suitable for you once you know what you're looking for because that's the thing right you you look at different courses and you go oh this one covers this and this one covers that but actually it might be that they're all on live skype or zoom meetings that you have to dial into or you get a replay but you can't ask questions on the replay and it's at midnight in your time, so you're not going to stay up and watch it. Or it might be it's videos in YouTube, or it might be that there's lots and lots of exercises that you send off to get marked. However it works in terms of its format, it needs to be something that works for you, not just, well, this course covers this, and this course covers that, and this is what I'm interested in. The next question that often comes up is whether you should pay and how much you should pay. And this is, again, really, really controversial. I see so many arguments over this. Um, so I'm going to say I have never come across anyone yet who has done a paid course. Um, and when I say paid course, I mean one that's been accredited or has a certification or a qualification at the end of it relating to tarot or runes where they haven't felt it, they got something out of it, or they haven't enjoyed it, or that it wasn't worth doing. Some of the cheaper end courses, which are not accredited or certified, I've come across people say, well, you know, they were poorly put together, but again, they weren't accredited, there's no one else sort of supervising the putting together of this course so it might be that you kind of get what you pay for and if you go on a discount site it might be you know what you pay for is not so good and other people are absolutely insistent you should never pay for any kind of knowledge which um you know if they want to believe that that works for them fine 
but this is about helping you figure out what works for you. But I will point out a few things because you do get a lot of people not seeming to understand the basics here. So if someone is teaching you personally, they are spending time with you that they could be spending on their hobbies, on their other pursuits. They could be at another job earning income to pay for their rent or their mortgage, their bills, their food, for their children, etc. So bear in mind that often you will need to pay people for their time. And this is true of any other service-based industry. If you want a plumber, you need to pay them. If you want a musician, you're going to need to pay them. And I will point out a lot of people that talk about spiritual gifts, you shouldn't pay for them. Back in the day, there would be the village. And everyone in the village contributed. And everyone in the village was provided with housing, with food. And everyone had a part to play. And the spiritual elders, the healer, the people be- that were teaching, everyone had something that they communicated they provided to the community even if it wasn't going out and hunting and gathering or trading with other communities and therefore they were given somewhere to live and in our world that exists in the form of money so I'm just going to point that out so some people and I've mentioned this before they may have to do teacher training in order to get their courses accredited that costs a lot of money as I said it can cost hundreds or even thousands of pounds or dollars whatever your currency is if they are using platforms to host their content this is not free just a basic website most people pay about 10 pounds a month for a website um, if you choose not to use a free one that's got lots of advertising on it some people have to make back that website hosting fee by hosting adverts on their site the more visitors you get often the fee for your website hosting goes up Um, so if you're thinking someone's got a big really successful site then they're going to be paying more just for the privilege of having all those visitors go to their site Um, if you host a course with videos Um, you can't offer paid content through platforms such as YouTube you have to go to private platforms such as Vimeo or Wistia and they cost hundreds of pounds a year for a subscription Um, if you're if you have a podcast or anything that's providing free content you have to pay a monthly subscription I think the There are one or two free ones which have very limited storage space, but I've seen the cheaper packages for um, hosts like Libsyn and being around, yeah, you can get like a $5 a month, but that's very limited. You need to look at about $30 a month, US dollars. So these people are paying to provide content to you. They might have to provide, um, pay a designer to make something look presentable because, you know, they can download everything in a word document and it looks horrendous um you've seen a couple of spelling mistakes in this presentation they often pay for a proofreader so they are paying out of their pocket in many cases to provide this content to you and also if you're expecting someone to review or mark your work or provide insights because they've actually taken time to read the readings of whatever work you've done or offer you specific advice again you might have to expect to pay an hourly rate because this is an hour they could have spent with someone else or doing something else or earning money to be able to afford to live so don't be surprised if they do quote you an hourly rate but do ask the quote and just remember if someone's told you that they don't work for free You don't have to go to them if you really are against um, people asking for money for their services. Don't make them feel bad. They need to do it. If your boss insisted that you're talented at your job, therefore they're not going to pay you because it's your gift, how would you feel? Um, So just bear, bear in mind, if someone chooses to charge, they can choose to charge. That doesn't mean you can have a go at them. And unfortunately that happens a lot. 
if you don't believe in paying for something, that's fine. But bear in mind that we're in a society where you should be contributing and giving as well as receiving. And at the end of the day, if people don't have money to be able to pay their bills, they're not going to be able to provide any service to anyone. So just bear that in mind and be gentle. Now, you'll notice I haven't said how much should you pay and given a qualitative figure and said, you know, for this, you should pay this, for that, you should pay that. That's because you do need to think about what's included. So some packages might be all online and it's all pre-recorded and it's relatively cheap aside from the hosting fees because the person's put together the content once and you can download as you go and that's not you know so involved other people will offer a facebook support group uh, they'll have a support forum they're highly involved they've got live calls those you're going to expect to pay more because you're getting some kind of personal interaction and feedback so you're going back to this hourly rate if you're getting mentoring or you're providing work and it's being marked or you're getting individual feedback expect to pay more if you're doing anything such as a final exam, again, expect to pay more. If there is something such as groups that are being organised where, where someone is pairing you up with peers and they're moderating how you interact with the peers, the more moderation they do, the more you can expect to pay. Um, so bear in mind when you're looking at the format of courses and how much content is given, the pricing may not be just based on the content. It may also be based on this person's experience. It may be um, based on the amount of content, how much it costs them to produce and host all this content, um, how much interaction they have with you, how much they're putting in whether it's a once and done, whether they've got staff helping you to navigate the course or providing feedback, all those are going to affect the price. So rather than think about how much you should pay, have a look at what's included in the price and whether you feel that it's offering you value. And if you feel it is giving you value, that is fine. It's where you feel it's not giving you the value you want. And of course, don't forget to look at things such as whether there are reviews, um, who's giving the review, what's their connection to the person doing the course, what they enjoyed from the course, uh, how they feel it improved their personal practice or the readings that they give compared to if they hadn't done it. Um, was that course a kind of fast track for them because it had everything in a structured place, whereas to get the same thing would have you know, required them reading lots of books and maybe taking years to put together the information themselves in a different way. So do talk to people that have done the course, especially for paying more. So I hope that helped. Um, I'm expecting lots of comments on this video, both Screaming Pro and Con doing tarot certifications or any other kind of divination certification. Please, please, please ignore whatever people think you should do and just tune in to what your thoughts and the way you work and what you feel is the right thing for you um, and don't let other people get in there and try and make that decision for you so I hope you found that helpful and I look forward to reading comments <laughs> I'm partially dreading them but I am looking forward to reading them and seeing what people say Take care and I will see you in some other videos soon.